The following information is appeal level worthy material in simple wording with no extremely confusing concepts and terminology. My adopted organism, the Pacific walrus, has a lot more to it than it looks. The unique characteristic out of the many that the walrus possesses that I'm going to focus on today is perhaps the most misunderstood characteristic that it has, its whiskers. And to prove that very point, I shall include a clip of a cartoon of what typical walrus misrepresentation looks like. There's two things about the whiskers that apply to what we've learned in AP Biology this past year. The first would be evolution. The whiskers of the walrus, the more technical term is vibrissae, are for it to forage for mussels on the ocean bed. Walruses generally dive around 80 to 90 meters below water to look for mussels to gorge on. However, their eyesight and the generally murky conditions of the water close to the ocean bed hampers it from using its sight effectively to find mussels. Thus, it uses its whiskers to detect them. There used to be many, many species of walruses back in the day. Right now, we only have one species, which is further divided into the two subspecies, the Pacific and the Atlantic walrus. As you can see, there's a slight variation between these two subspecies. I mean, just based off the eyes alone, the Atlantic walrus seems to have smoked one too many blunts. The original species of walrus was pretty different from the modern species of walrus. To state the obvious, it didn't have tusks. Scientists originally thought that it feasted on large birds and other marine mammals based on an upper jaw fossil that they found off the coast of Japan. Recently, they found a lower jaw fossil of the ancient walrus off the coast of Los Angeles. They figured that it was unlikely that it had the capacity to deliver such a bone-crushing bite. So the ancient walrus was thought to have eaten primarily fish instead of the aforementioned large birds and marine mammals. In a recent experiment done to test the sensitivity of a walrus's vibrissae, walruses were shown fish. And when I say shown fish, the fish were literally propped in front of them. They didn't react. However, when the fish brushed against their whiskers, they would react and eat the fish. It took around 1 to 1.2 seconds from first interception with the whiskers to eating the fish, on average. This shows the extent to how important their whiskers are to them for feeding. The ancient species of walrus had longer, sparser, and less hairs for their whiskers. Thus, their whiskers weren't very used when they were hunting for fish. When water levels rose, and the world became a hotter place, ancient walruses migrated north of the coasts of Cali and Japan to Greenland, Norway, and Canada in search of a colder environment. Now this is really significant in the evolution of their whiskers. Statistics from 1998 show that the second and third top fish dense countries of wild fish are Japan and the United States respectively. This was where the walruses were from originally. However, Greenland, along with Canada, doesn't even make it on the list. My friend Norway makes it to number 8, but it produces 2.9 million tons annually, compared to Japan's over 5 million tons and the US's 4.7 million tons. The lack of fish in the areas that it now resides in is evident. Thus, they resorted to trawling on the bottom of the seafloor, foraging for mussels. To excavate tasty treats on the seafloor, they take in a mouthful of water and spit it out in powerful jet, jet stream-like bursts, generating a lot of muck that hampers their already poor eyesight. Thus, they have to rely on their whiskers for feeding. Over time, their whiskers evolved into shorter, denser, and more hairs that allow for heightened sensitivity to detect mussels, which had become their primary source of food. The second topic I'm going to go into is the mechanism of the walrus's vibrissae. Each individual whisker is linked to its own blood source in the form of a capsule, which contains many sensory nerves, 
which makes it just as sensitive as a human's fingers. They're each linked to muscles and nerves that, ul that ultimately signal to the brain what is going on. Overall, walrus generally has around 400 to 700 vibrissae. Walruses depend on them almost completely for the sense of touch. To identify a muscle using the vibrissae, the walrus generally exerts its vibrissae muscles to move its vibrissae in an up-down motion. Generally, it only needs the vibrissae closest to its nostril to identify what it's brushing against. The larger and sharper the muscle, the easier it is for the walrus to identify it. As they eat around 2-6% to of their body weight every single day, they have to eat large amounts of muscles in small amounts of time so they can't spend too much time identifying the muscle. In less than 4% of a second, they are able to move their vibrissae up and down and identify in most scenarios if what their vibrissae is brushing against is a rock or a muscle. The signal from the vibrissae's nerves are related to the brain through the usage of a process called somatotopy. Defined, it's basically a map of all the body surface area that our brains draw out. When the walrus's brain receives the signal, it knows that it's coming from the vibrissae, the most sensitive part of the walrus. It's often referred to as a tactile organ, which is an organ that is connected to touch. The brain receives the signal from the vibrissae and is able to identify the object. In a few cases, dead walrus carcasses washed ashore and broken down by scientists show rocks and pebbles in walrus stomachs. There are two reasons that their vibrissae failed them at times, the first being that it is too long. Walruses need to scratch their vibrissae on rocks occasionally, much like trimming a beard, in order to keep them short and sensitive. The second reason would be that they had sustained a traumatic injury at the base of the vibrissae, which damages the vibrissae's nerve endings and renders it unable to defer a pebble from a muscle. Walruses suck muscles right from their shells. The sucking is so powerful and fast that it doesn't have time to react if the muscle doesn't come out. And instead, so that's how pebbles and rocks are accidentally eaten. I'd like to thank Mr. Comet for being such a great teacher this year. And I've had a lot of fun, but a lot of stress at the same time doing this project because there's not a lot of information on walruses' vibrissae. I hope it was bearable and not too boring. And that's all for today's episode on the vibrissae of walruses. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great quarantine, if that's even possible to accomplish.